Most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle, struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness with Chris Doris, and today's guest is one of my favorite people in the world. We have Devin Bandison today coming to you live from Queens, New York, baby. You'd never know by listening to him that he's from New York, but we'll see. Devin is the founder of the Devin Bandison Company. Uh, Devin and I have very similar backgrounds. We're both ballers. We were, we were, I wasn't as good as him because I, I didn't get Scottish yet. Uh, I actually had to turn down Villanova to attend Muhlenberg, <laughs> but whatever. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, we both played hoops all our lives, and um, and we also started our, our professional careers in really similar fashion. Both as uh, social workers working in tough hoods with uh, either at risk or, as you say in your book, at hope clients, which right. I thought was a pretty cool spin there. Um, Devin's an author, a speaker, and a coach. He is the author of this uh, hot off the press international bestseller. Come and get you some. Took about a minute to go bestseller. <laughs> about a hot minute. I can't even put, I can't even use my own copy because it's all folded up. It's like a textbook to me. You know, so I, I stand it there and it's just, just wanting to stand up. But um, yeah, so here's the book, Fatherhood is Leadership. And, and I love the subtitle too, which is your playbook uh, for success, self-leadership and a richer life. Uh, this is a must read for any father. I, sh I had a lunch this week <clears throat> with a dear friend of mine who's a grandfather uh, who's going through some rough times. This, I can't even tell, I'm getting like choked up just saying this, honest to God. Uh, it's so meaningful to him to see, to see what, what he, he took out of this. Like he, I swear it's true. He annotated your book, man. He had pieces of paper, about 50 of them, through the whole, he read it twice. He read every word. I mean, he read e like every single word. And he had tons of questions and, and he was pointing out what was meaningful to him. And, and uh, like, you know, and, and this, I told you what he said. He said, this is a book that every father needs to read. But he said, you know what else it is? It's a book that every grandfather needs to read, needs to read. So this is powerful stuff, man. I, I think it's, I'm sharing it with everybody that I know. That's a father recommended two more. Uh, a buddy of mine just bought it yesterday who just had, a, just had a baby. And I'm going to be giving it to my trainer who also has a young boy. So, uh, so check it out. Get it on Amazon, everybody. Give it to all your father and grandfather friends. Um, it's actually not, I, I'm sorry, I mispronounced the title. My bad. It's Fatherhood. Well, it's, it's, that's right. It's, say it. What's the title of your that's book? On, it's on New York. You know, fatherhood, fatherhood. It's not father. Fatherhood. <laughs> that sounds. Say that again. W. That, that's so <laughs> oh, Why do you say that, Chris? Because when I when I went to North Carolina to play ball, um, when I first my first first day down there, the people down North Carolina was kept saying, "We're going to the mall. We're going to the mall." And I was like, "What the heck is the mall?" And I talk about the mall. Because uh, there's a W in all words, you know, in New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I know it. I'm not from far away. So Devin and I have some rivalries going on. <clears throat> I can't. Yeah, right. Mm, not a fan. I got nothing Phillies in here, do I? Oh, my goodness. I got nothing Phillies in here. <laughs> um, I'm going, by the way, buddy. I just bought my plane ticket to the last Phillies game of the season playing the Mets at our place. That's right. Maybe you want to come down for that game. Right. I might do that. I might do that and bring my Mets hat so I can join uh, you guys. <laughs> you know what? We got to make a date on that. You got to do it. Yeah. You got to come. Yeah. All right? It'll be cool. So uh, Devin and I met, I don't know, a few years ago, really. It seems like a lot longer because I feel like our friendship is a lot deeper than it is chronologically long. <clears throat> we met through Steve Chandler's um, at the time. I, I don't know if it was called the ACS or the, C, the Coaching Prosperity or Advanced Client Systems. I think it was Advanced Client Systems. I think we met in Fort Lauderdale, as a matter of fact. Yep. Right. Yeah. And then, and then we, we hung out again in, at San Antonio uh, for another group. Uh, and you have a chapter in your book, uh, something that you know, almost. I didn't know about this till I read it. 
um, death at 35,000 feet. I don't know that I heard that story because we were together minutes before that and, and you yeah. get off and almost die on a plane. So that, I mean, this is riveting. I, you know, I'm not gonna like over pimp this out, but I probably can't do that because that's how good it is. Um, this is, I, I, I had things to do, so I had to stop and I couldn't stop. I'm like, I put an earmark on the page when I got to like 100 and then I'm like, ah, he's just a little more, you know? And ended up reading two more chapters uh, before I had to, I had like a client appointment. So that's, that's how good it is, powerful. You're an amazing storyteller, dude. And that's what's so beautiful about, one of the things I love most about you, to tell you the truth, is, uh, is your stories and how you tell them. And not that they're just fun and funny as hell, but every time you tell a story, you're like this like Yoda dude. You, you spin in some really like powerful like uh, shocker life lessons. You're like, well, I thought we were just telling a funny story about growing up you know, in New York area, and now you're rocking my world. I'm thinking about like, being a better person all of a sudden. So <clears throat> I'm excited to have you here, dude. I'm really excited to have you um, on the show, and and let's talk a little bit about. Um, oh, and the, I'm sorry, I didn't. I got a second to talk about fatherhood leadership, and I didn't even mention your three amazing children, right? So you got you got uh, Kayla, Kayla who is 20, right, in college, yep. right, and then um, you got Justice who's 15, and then uh, Friday night pizza night man Omari who's seven, seven. Right? right? And Funny I, I and I tell you every Friday I think about you, I'm jealous. I, I I love New York pizza, <laughs> and you know who doesn't? I mean, if you don't like New York pizza, you just head get off. Hang on. That's uh, right. And you gotta fold it and make sure that the grease drips out, or it's not New York pizza. That's right. There's no cutting. There's no forks. There's none of that. Yeah. New York. <laughs> That's right. And it's definitely folding. You gotta fold it. You mentioned my children on the uh, cover. Steve actually said, where did you get those good-looking child actors? Because they couldn't be yours. So, uh, <laughs> they are damn good-looking. That's looking. pretty fun. Yeah, they are damn good. <laughs> so yeah, you know what You're I got here, right? You know what I got going on right here. I know you know it. Bulletproof. I have mine already. Yeah, you're three, hours, my... ahead. You're three hours ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I didn't get mine yet, so I'm not as sharp as you. So I'll do my best. I'll try to keep up. All right? So <laughs> yeah, all let's right. talk. Let's talk let's, all right. So let, tell me, before we get into the mental toughness stuff, because there's, there's tremendous, I mean, there's so much overlap between, you know, I mean, I could use, I could put my language to spin onto yours about leadership. <clears throat> and the mental toughness that it takes to be, um, you know, an amazing dad and an amazing leader, uh, to create an amazing life, um, given a challenging background. So let's just talk a little bit, a little bit about you, um, and a little bit about the book. And yeah, I, I mean, and first of all, huh? I no, I yeah. just, just tell. I, I want to hear about like the book. When did the book come out? The book came out in August, so, so I don't know when this is airing, but yeah, just a month, month ago. And, and, and thank you for the kind words. I mean, Chris, you know, um, although it sold well, the most important thing about it is exactly that story you said about the grandfather. Because I really wrote this book. Um, you know, I, I, I have a quote, I think, in the book that says, you don't have to change the world by some new invention. You could do it one conversation at a time, one kind act at a time. Um, and, and one, you know, one kind act at a time. Yeah. And um, I think that that is meaningful to me, that if one father, one grandfather, one family see, picks it up and, and it creates a shift in the paradigm of how they're seeing things, um, to me, my job is done. And it was a similar story of a woman that you had, um, that you said that she was on the train, she bought it for her, her guy, and she said, let me dive into it. And she was reading it on the train. And she, and she wrote me this text. I was supposed to get out on 63rd and Lex. But I went to the first place I could go because I didn't want to put the book down. That's and, awesome. Wow, that's so great. That's so, super great. Yeah, so I got into it, Chris, man. Um, fatherhood to me, you know, is a journey. I grew up in New York, born and raised, like you said, played ball. Um, my father was actually my hero growing up. He created um, the, the, the biggest... A basketball league in New York City. So by six, seven years old, I was run, I was doing the books at games, and I would see guys like Mark Jackson, Chris Mullen, all the great players in New York City. So it was like a really cool time to grow up. That, that is, you know? so now, so you mentioned Rucker Park also in the book. Did you ever get ever? Did you ever get to see Dr. J play there, or was he already in the league? Dr. J was already in the league. So I just heard stories about uh, this guy named. <clears throat> who actually 
you know, never made it an NBA because of drugs, but he, he apparently, uh, legend has it, dropped 70, 70 points on, on Dr. J at a Rucker Park game. So. <laughs> I, I find that a little bit hard to believe. Dr. J is my all-time sports hero, so, I, so I, until I get verification of that, I'm not buying it. <laughs> all right, all right, cool. I'll get you out here and we'll go to a Rucker <laughs> We'll go to the old, the old guy to tell the story and, and the thing that you, we talk about mental toughness too like what i realized was i didn't realize in the moment my father would tell these stories about basketball but i think that's where some of the storytelling came because he would weave in these life lessons that mm. as a young guy i kind of didn't get until later it hit me and said oh wow that's what he was talking about about choices and mindset and, and things like that um wow. so the book yeah and the book was an evolution of my life man and you know around 16 years old my father our, gr our grandmother passed away and he took it hard and there's a lot of drug addiction in the home and and um, it really fell victim to a serious drug drug addiction. And at that point, I remember at 16, somehow blaming myself. And what I did was I made this promise, I call it the promise that many young people have when, when their father isn't is absent. And the promise is when I become a, a father, I'm gonna be a better father. Um, and then when we had our daughter at 23, I was more present, but I had no clue what I was doing. Um, so, you know, it was just this learning process. And I started out um, in a nonprofit, and we talk about that a lot. And, and it was a similar upbringing, yeah. working with what I call at hope youth. And, <clears throat> at and hope then they youth. at hope youth. And we used to go in the homes and work with children who were really at risk of hospitalizations or suicide or you know, really difficult behavioral issues. And, and it really was the start of a, a great career. And I eventually became the director and I, I started developing programs for first time fathers in the South Bronx, which was really cool, meaningful work. Yeah, um, and you said that this, that, that, but that was for people from ages 13 up? Yes. Oh, like to, to, to just like, whatever. Yeah. Thir I, and I did have to read that again. And then I read the parental, parenthetical comment after, yeah, you read that right, 13. Fathers uh, yeah. starting at third, that's amazing. Our youngest father in the program at that time, 13, and, and um, he was wow. showing up, man. And, uh, it, and it was funny, as my career took off and the programs did well, um, you know, I saw some correlation later on when I started working with some of these other guys, some athletes and CEOs, that some of the same issues were coming up. And, and that's kind of how I got into, you know, eventually I got into coaching because, uh, you know, I could tell that story and go on and on. Yeah. But, uh, but you studied, you majored great... in psychology, right? I majored in psychology. <clears throat> I got a master's in public administration. And, and the programs that I ran, I was director of, had all, you know, social workers and, and psychologists and things like that. So it was so, great. It was meaningful work. Yeah, right. All of it. And so you really, I mean, you can make the argument that you've only worked in capacities that actually do require mental toughness, not just not on your part, but also on the part of your clients. And that, you know, uh, I am comfortable saying, based on what I know about your professional history and your personal history, that you're a mental coach, dude. You're a mental toughness coach. It's not the word, those aren't the words you use to describe yourself, but I could easily make that argument, easily make that argument. Uh, but but let, me, let me not put words in your mouth. I wanna hear from you, because as you know, the whole purpose of this series, the Tough Talk series, is, and the reason it's called Tough Talks is because it's on mental toughness, right? So, uh, and I'm interviewing people from all different walks of life. And, and, and the, the point is so that m my listeners can get really diverse perspectives from people. They hear enough from me. So, I, you know, we want to hear from you. So, like, what does mental toughness mean to you, to Devin Bandis? Yeah, I mean, and first... First of all, it's an honor because I, I consider you the guru of mental toughness, man. And coming up, I mean, really, you were one of the guys I listened to all the time and, and the audios and, and seeing how you work with people. And when I think of mental toughness, there's a, a few things, but the one word I think would be resilience, right? I think that um, I, I take back, you know, when I was a basketball player, there's a couple things that I used to become um, pretty good. And, and what it was, was you develop some kind of practice first. And I think for you to have, it starts with one practice, but also a mindset of, of how you're looking at things. Um, and for me, that's where the work starts, that it's an inside out kind of thing where it's, if, if you look within for mental toughness, if you look within for your practice, I think that no matter what comes along, whatever 
whatever circumstances you're able to be resilient through it. And I saw it in the, in the people I work with, but also in my own personal life, um, that there was an option. There's always an option. There's, there's always an option after the practice, done, after you take the 500 shots, after you meditate, after you read, after you get coached, there's always an option in the present moment, right? To either take ownership of that moment and, and, and play big, or go down kind of the ladder of consciousness and, and yeah. Let, let, let's slow that down. <clears throat> let's slow that down and elaborate on that because I think that's a huge point. And let's make sure that, because you're using language that I think is maybe familiar to some and maybe not familiar to others, like, like particularly the ladder of consciousness, right? Um, spiraling up, spiraling down. Uh, just elaborate on what does all that mean? Yes. Yeah, so what it means to me is that for me to have mental toughness in any given moment, for me, yeah, um, I had to develop some kind of practice, right? I had to develop, you know, like when I was playing ball, I used to look at the great players, right? And I used to mimic them for a while until I, I came into my own game, mm -hmm. right? So whether your practice is, uh, I think that one of the things I like to say is that the analogy of a cup with the saucer, not a saucer, right? The saucer, right? <laughs> um, and, and I think that mental toughness for me is, you know, oftentimes as men, as fathers, as women, as entrepreneurs, as teachers, whatever we are, we, we continually feed people out of our saucer and eventually the saucer becomes empty. And when the saucer is empty, we get burnt out, we're not at our best, and we're really not mentally tough. We, we, we kind of come down and, and we're not at our best. Um, so for me, the, the key to mental toughness is how do we fill our saucer? Mm. How do we continue to take care of ourselves so when we fill it so much where there's an overflow. And now when I'm, when I'm serving my children, when I'm serving my coaching clients, when I'm speaking, I'm serving them out of the saucer and never out of the cup. And for me, uh, hmm. mental toughness is a constant awareness that I got to keep filling my cup. How do you do it? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, I remember, you know, for me, I'm from New York, right? You're from Philly. So growing up, the hustle wasn't hard. Like I knew how to get things and do things. Um, what I really didn't understand is, is kind of who I was becoming as I was doing things. So I remember going to California and um, I had this to-do list of things what, to do, right? Wait, and I went, where, where, wait, where in California was it that you went? Oh, at first, I, you know, it was spelled, uh, I called it OJ because it was spelled O-J-A-I. <laughs> <laughs> Until someone said, you know, Devin, OJ is that guy we don't talk about. Yeah, this is right, Ojai. Ojai. So, yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, but, but what I learned was in different things is that there's also a power in slowing down. So for me, mental mm. toughness is a combination of doing and being. So here's an example. Um, I have a, a, a practice that I do every morning. I, I used to be the guy who had the phone next to me, the laptop, and I'd wake up, right? And the first thing I'd do is go out and try to serve people. And I found myself low energy, not performing high. And, mm. and someone once said, he said, let me get this right. You, you wake up and you serve the world, but you don't take care of yourself first. Uh, so one of my practices to get, you know, to have mental toughness is to create a space in my day, which is when I wake up, the first hour, I call it the power hour. And, yeah. and it's a combination of um, things, you know, the, the P stands for Pete. So my first 20 minutes is quiet meditation. The O is openness, which is when I'm writing. The W, I ask three questions. Who needs me today? What do I need to do? And why am I doing what I'm about to do? And the reason why those questions are important is the who needs me, the only people who show up on that every day is my kids. And it, it starts, you can't be everybody to, you know, everything to everybody. So it starts kind of prioritizing. The what is I keep it to one or two, one to three things I want to do every day. And then the why is, why am I doing what I'm about to do? You know, it's like the old, Steve Jobs thing when he used to go in the mirror and say, if this was the last day of my life, yep. would I do what I'm about to do? So yeah. that's the tip for you. Then the, um, the E is for exercise, some kind of movement. And the R is reading or, or TED Talks or some uh, the all in audio, um, whatever I, I practice, you know, that's part of my practice. And that's how I start my day. And once I do that, already I feel mentally fit. I feel, I feel conscious. I feel yeah. aware. Then I can serve the world. That's cool. Some I don't remember. You probably know who, who this is because I'm forgetting who said this. It might have been Tim Ferriss. I don't know who it was, <clears throat> but it's like if you win the morning, you've won the day. Yeah. You ever yeah, hear that? Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, I heard it. And, and I don't know if it was Tim Ferriss. There's another guy who prided himself. I know he said, I try to do more before 10 a.m. Um, than most people do all day. And when I say do more, it's not busy work. It's kind of like, how do I fill my cups so I can show up for my, for my children, uh, for my friends, uh, the best I can. And, so hold on. Um, so the other, that's, the other... that's really huge. Hold, hold that thought, whatever you're just about to say. Uh, yeah. Because, again, I want to speak of slowing down. I want to slow that down. Uh, how? Okay, so the whole thing's slowing down. You're, you start your morning, uh, the first word, the power hour, so it's an hour. Uh, so you take about an hour. Yep, about an hour. And you start with peace. So you slow down. Uh, all right, so let's just talk about that again. Uh, so, so peace, what are, what are you doing there? Are you meditating? What's up? Peace is a, a meditation, some quiet time, quiet meditation, and uh, I sit with myself. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the E. The O. I mean, o. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's, well, in Philly, we spell power with an E. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's oh. how it New York, too. We used to do that until they changed the curriculum. So, <laughs> so O is for, again, what? Openness. So that's when I open my journal and I write some free-flowing thoughts and, and things like that. Get some flow. All right. And then the questions, the W, which is and the three Ws. Who needs me today? Who needs me today? I, what do I need to do, which what? I keep to one to three things. Okay. And oh. then why am I doing what I'm about to do? Why am I doing it? That's powerful. Okay. And then, and then the E. Exercise. Some kind of movement. Just some kind of movement. And then um, the R. Is e e e reading a book, audio book, watching TikTok. Wait, so it, like it just, Skype just messed up when you said R. What's those R stand for again? Sorry, R is reading, so that could okay, be reading so a read book, book okay, listening cool. to a TED talk, stuff like that. That's cool. So that's great. Um, how, you know, so tell us a story. You know, how has mental toughness played a role in your life? Yeah, so mental toughness. I mean, I, I love that you bring this. You're bringing this to the world because I think that when you talk about resilience, it really through those practices. And through understanding that in life, there's going to be ebbs and flows. There's going to be things that you think are um, kind of good in the moment or mm. bad. Um, mm. I don't try to, now that I know that, you know, the, the, the times in my life where I thought were the worst times were actually things that propelled me to, to another level. Yeah. Um, so for me, mental toughness this plays a life up. <clears throat> allows me to kind of continually be centered, not all the time. But even when things are going not in my favor, right? Even when things are tough, or my children have a, you know, are having a tough time, or or our business may be having a tough time, that allows me to get present and understand that if I continue with the practice, that all of this stuff is just my thoughts and it will pass. And and mental toughness allows allows me to not get over worried or fearful or or and things like that about stuff that just maybe just passes. So you talk a lot about that in the book, and that is a practice. <clears throat> so, you, I mean, you talk a lot. Look, you know, something that you haven't said out loud that I'll say for you is that you've always been a student of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. You've always it's, been, you've it's always huge. been, well, it's, you've been interested in it, okay? You know, <clears throat> the guy that I mentioned earlier, the grandfather, he is uh, literally a famous hand surgeon here. Uh, there is a, a um, they built the hospital that he worked at right down the street here, and they built a new wing, named it after him. He's a big deal here, right? And we went out to lunch. He came, he dropped me off, um, and, and as I was getting out, he said, you know what? He's like, I, I learned, I spent my life becoming master of my craft at doing amazing surgeries on hands, right? And he said, as I read your stuff, and I gave him some of my stuff, and he says, and your buddy's stuff, he goes, I realize that, uh, you know, what you guys are up to is way bigger. And I thought, this is coming from a champion. Now, I didn't agree with him, and, and I, but I want to take that, <clears throat> because, and, and I, I have a reason to bring this up. Um, I actually, I thought about it, I said, thank you, that's beautiful, and I don't think I agree with you, because if what we're up to Right, teaching um, people how to do what you just said, which is 
become an observer of your thoughts and learn to strengthen them. If we were taught to do that in grade school, man, then he wouldn't have been saying that because he would have just been, you know, he was just, it would have been familiar. And, and, and that's why I'm doing this series, dude, right, is, is to bring uh, to the world, you know, awareness of what we weren't made aware of when we were kids in school. Okay. 100%. You keep using the word practice and practice and, and practice, and you're talking about the thoughts. So, so you have always been practicing strengthening the way that you use your mind. You have always been doing that, right? So, so let's once again slow down to what you just said, all right, and and talk about. It. So, so if you were going to teach somebody right now, which is exactly what you're doing, uh, how to become um, what I call a thought warrior which is to just, just to become aware of even your thoughts so that you can mani manipulate them. H how do you do that? Cause, cause this is like, it's like, we know how to get like um, biceps. We know how to do curls. We know how to get, you know, tries, you know, do these deals. And uh, we know lots about physical exercise and it's tangible and we're familiar with it. The mental exercises are intangible and uh, we're not familiar. So, so how do you make that accessible? Yeah, Chris, um, great question. And I agree. I wish this stuff that you're teaching also, it was in schools. You know, I think that, you know, we'd be well or better off mm -hmm. um, and, and more, more better adjusted adults. But for me, when I work, I just was having this conversation with a client is um, it, one of the biggest insights I, I gained. And it was intuitive because, you know, and I want to tell everybody out there that it's nothing you have to go outside to get. You already have everything you need inside of you to have this mental toughness and create this practice and have this awareness. It's not, let me go find the guru. Let me go to this community. Um, we already have it inside of us. Um, I remember hearing you with Michelangelo that I, I'm putting in the book about chipping away, but for me, when I talk about it, the first thing I, I try to ask, challenge people on is, do you believe you are your thoughts? Because that is the first mm. question mm. I think we have to ask. Wow. And, and my breakthrough came when I mm. realized I am not my thoughts, right? Mm. So you talked about it a little before about once I realize I'm not my thoughts, I can then become an observer of my thoughts. It's like being on the train or watching the train go by. And, and I have great listen. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, that's a great analogy. I'm totally stealing that. That's great. You got it. Um, there's no stealing. It's only influence. I I heard, so. Roger that. Um, so when I, when I know I'm the observer of my thoughts, because listen, think about it. Think about all the thoughts we have every day. If, if people, like, I, people would be in jail, everyone would be in jail if mm. we went to jail for our thoughts, right? If, if the stuff... <laughs> I don't know about everyone else, but I don't hence, know about me. Hence right. the title of our good buddy's book, which we'll get to soon when he finally makes time for this, because he's really too cool for his, too sexy for his shirt right now. But anyway, to be continued. That's right. Right? So, so the first thing for me is, okay, once I become the observer of my thoughts, every time a thought comes, right, I have to, in the present moment, I question, is this true? Right? Is, is, this, is this true or is this just a thought? Right? And, and the beauty about having that in, in, Hold on. in the moment. Is this true? Yeah. Man, you're cruising. You're cruising. <laughs> There's so, Sorry, this man. is some powerful stuff, bro. Oh, wow. This is so good. Is this, there's a practice. That is a tool. Okay. So if you're listening to this, here's a takeaway. This is an actual thing. So you got that morning ritual. Here's another one. Get into the habit of paying attention to your thoughts and asking yourself, is this true or is this just a thought? Can you give me, Devin, an example of a time when just, I mean, anything, um, when you would, when you would want to slow down and go, wait, is this true? Like what would, what would be going, where would you be doing what when that would occur? When it would be uh, like a really good time for you to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this true? Like, what would you be thinking? Where would you be? Give me a circumstance. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you two, I'll give you one really serious one where, where you had the question, I remember my daughter was in college and uh, there was this incident that happened um, in college and uh, with with the young man and now I'm from New York so my first thoughts right come up <laughs> you know right? my first thoughts and, yeah. and you know I can share what, what kind of my thought was about what I how I want to handle it and in the moment 
Mm. Right? I said, you know, is this true? Is this true that, that this is what the situation is and, and how I want to react to it? Um, and what I did was I just left it there and allowed it kind of just to sit and eventually move away. And then once it moved away, I was, I was back in the present because my suffering yeah. always comes from saying, what's going to happen if I respond to this in the, in the uh -huh. future or if I stay in the past? If I can allow my thoughts to go past me and yeah. stay in the present, then I say, this isn't absolutely true. This isn't how I want to go. Um, I am uh, yeah. going to show what integrity looks like to my daughter, and that's how I show it. Oh, that's amazing. That is so beautiful. So, but it's all 100% contingent upon you dissociating from your thought content. Correct. That it's, it, it, this can't happen unless you can do that. So the first step is acknowledging what you said, which is I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. So now let's just become a, a curious, like scientific observer of them. And then ask, I guess, so the theme really is, is when I'm feeling agitated by life. Yeah. Or yeah, by my agitated. interpretation of it, of course. So when I'm feeling un agitated, yeah. fearful, um, like business, right? You may not have the month you want you want to have, and and then we get into some thinking about I'm gonna have m more months like this, I'm, I, and my business is gonna fail. Now we get the future, and that's the time to say, is this true mm. in this moment? Mm. Right? Is this true, or am I am I thinking in the future? If I could bring it back to the present, then there's really no suffering. You know, I, I, so what if, what if like, so I'm, I'm driving and we'll just use a simple example of traffic. Okay. <clears throat> I'm driving to a business meeting. All right. Yeah. Or I'm giving a talk. Let's say I've been hired to give a talk. Right. And, and I'm and it's up in Scottsdale. So I'm driving and there's traffic at a weird time of day. I'm like, what in the actual, and, and then, so I'm agitated. I'm nervous. I'm frustrated. Right. Uh, Cause I can't be late for this. I mean, they, they already paid me, man. I got, I got to be there for goodness sakes. And like, what if I'm late? So, I, so I got anxiety and frustration and agitation all arising within me because of the way I'm thinking in that moment. But I don't know that, otherwise I wouldn't be creating frustration. So I'm in it. So I'm on the train, right? So then, what if I say? Oh, well, you know, um, okay. So as I'm sitting in traffic, I'll do the practice and say. Well, um, is this really true? And I said, well, yeah, it's fucking true. I'm could be late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What the, am I done? Okay. No, you're not done because right. then I can say, then for me, it's okay. Who am I now becoming right uh -huh. now that I believe this is true? How am I responding? So now I'm becoming my thought. Like you said, I'm anxious. I'm frustrated. So now. I am, I have now failed in a way because I've become my thought in that moment, Okay. you know? So for instance, so then mm. what I do is I try to shift it around. Like for instance, in that moment, I'm in traffic or someone cuts me off or I'm late. Mm. I can respond to that. Go to my thought, get mad and respond, curse them out, um, curse, you know, curse in yeah. the car, be frustrated. And now the thought, now I'm living with the thought. I'm continuing to be miserable until I get there. And most likely you're not going to be at your best once you get there to that, to of course that not. appointment. Of course and, not. And, and, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So not. what happens is if I allow that person who cut me off or I'm staying in traffic and I just let them go, I could, I could go cut them off, curse them out again. I get it out. I think I feel better, but now that thought is still in my mind when all I needed to do uh -huh. is stay present and say, this will pass. But in this moment, mm. right? There's mm. a lot of people who love to, to listen to sports radio in traffic. Yeah. There's a lot of people who could think about the next, you know, to create something in the moment and, instead of getting ahead of themselves. The only reason you're frustrated and anxious in that moment, Chris, is because you left the present, you got on the train, and you're thinking about the consequences of when but, you show but, up but instead I, of I saying, what is the business? Yeah. I get that. However, I got to keep playing devil's advocate here because it still doesn't. So I'm in the present. And then, and so what does, so what is my thought when I'm in the present? So I'm like, okay, well, it's possible that I'll be late. And it's just like, that's just a possibility. Uh, but then I go back in the future. It's still true that I could like be late for an obligation for a speaking engagement or something or a, a, an important business meeting. So like, how do I reconcile that? Right. That's a good, so it's, it's true if you're living in the future. What's, Dude, what's re really true, 
what's really true is that you're in a car mm -hmm. in traffic. Mm -hmm. That's all that's going on. See, we're meaning makers. We have a mind that we want to make meaning of everything, right? Instead of saying what's really just going on is I'm in traffic. Yeah. And I have a choice in this moment uh -huh. to eat to eat either kind of moment in traffic, regardless of what I think is going on. Circumstances don't cause my feelings. My thoughts cause, cause my feelings. So right. we think that the traffic of being late is going to cause how we feel. It isn't that. It's our thought about being late or being in traffic. So in the moment, I have a choice to say, I can go this way with it and be miserable for the next 20 minutes and show up late. Or I could shift it and say, how can I create and be present and allow this to be the moment I'm in because if you can't find happiness and joy in this moment right now, mm -hmm. you'll be for it the rest of your life. Because <clears throat> this is the only place in the present. You know, I love that because then when I'm capable of being uh, the way you're saying, right, which is, to, which is to not have a problem by anticipating a disastrous future, say I, I do end up being late, I am capable now by having been present and cool with that uh, of utilizing that. Right. Right. So, I'll figure out a way to utilize that into the talk or I'll just I'll, I'll come up with some kind of creative methodology or or before I get to the talk or if it's a, an important meaning only when I cannot have a problem with what is can I create from it. Right. So I could come up with some creative idea. So it's possible that I'll be late for this meeting. So what could I do that? What can I create out of this? I like to say that every set of circumstances uh, can be leveraged for individual and collective gain if viewed masterfully. So, and that, that if is capital I and capital F, if viewed masterfully, which in your language means you're not on the train. You're just watching it going, oh, that's interesting. That's not what I anticipated. What can I create out of this? And that's cool. That's freedom. Right. And, and, and there's a difference between, you know, people may think, uh, look, and I like that you said if, a big if, because this isn't like you and I just float around and it's always perfect. I, I know this because I've practiced the other way. I've been the one who's been miserable in the moment, thinking of this disaster, and it never, it never helped me. Yeah. So I have the option of, of continuing to do something that never helps me, or <laughs> shifting my thinking. Right. Like right. And and um, yeah. It's all an opportunity, man. I, That's beautiful. This life thing is a game. Yeah. Like so, like I, the athletes. You you work with athletes. I work with this NBA guy, and and this and we used to say this when we grew up. If I miss ten shots. The 11th is going in, right? That's a shooter's mentality. I don't get caught up. Oh, I missed a shot. Nice shot. It's like, it's the next one. Let me stay yeah. present yeah. and stay ready. Right on. That's great. Yeah. Whereas most people would, would story that in a way like, oh, I'm off tonight. Or right. like we used to say, I can't put the ball in the ocean. So I better start passing or coach take me out. So hey, I want to just for a second, I want to acknowledge what that is behind you on your whiteboard. What is happening here? You're, you're going to amp. No, that's not what I was talking about, dude. <laughs> no, I was talking about above that. You're getting all in on a book tour, an international book tour. We've got New York, LA here, Port St. Lucie, Florida, Charlotte, North Carolina, Tucson, and Amsterdam. Somebody's heading Amsterdam over to Amsterdam. Amsterdam and UK. That a baby. Yes. And then the UK. Right on, dude. Congratulations on the tremendous success, um, your tremendous success, and the ridiculously rapid success of this powerhouse book. Again, Fatherhood is Leadership. Get it on Amazon. And where do you want people to go if they want to um, connect with you or learn yeah. more about you? I'm, I'm all over social media, just Devin Bandison. Um, the book and, and the movement is on fatherhoodisleadership.com, or you can just look at devinbandison.com. And that, so. that is not spelled F-A-W-T-H, it's just F-A-T-H? Yeah, no, F-A-W, fatherhood. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <right>. <laughs> uh, I'm going to beat that dead horse for a long time. All right, brother, thank you so much, man. I totally appreciate you. I, I love you, man, and, and thanks for sharing your wisdom with my peeps today. Love you too. Keep up the good work, my brother. You too, babe. Thanks. All right, man. Peace. Peace.